I think technology will constantly make new tools available for us that reduces time, that reduces repetitiveness. And the remaining contribution we can have as designers and creators would be kind of curating these different array of tools and making sure that there is a novel application behind whatever it is that we're using these tools with. Welcome to the Getting Simple Podcast. Getting Simple is about simplifying your life and doing less better. Hello and welcome to the Getting Simple Podcast. I am your host, Nono Martinez Alonso. Today, our guest is uh, G. Hello. Thanks for having me, Nono. She's originally from Seoul, Korea. That's right. Well, I grew up along the East Coast. She um, holds a Bachelor in Fine Arts from Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. Yes. And as I did, uh, she did a Master in Design Studies at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Yeah, so my focus was in art, design, and the public domain. She's done work in collaboration with the Harvard Folk Museum, uh, helping for uh, building the archive of Christopher Wilmer. Wilmer. Yep. And she's also worked with the uh, Sustainability Office at MIT and also has done some work with the Sustainability Office in Harvard. Yep, it's softness. Yep. Yeah, I would love if you could tell us a bit more about yourself. How has your career been so far and what are you working on right now? So currently I'm working at an innovation school in Cambridge called Nuvu, and that's a fairly new development. Previously, I was working at a software company that was specializing in adaptive learning technologies for physicians, but mostly I like to consider myself as a visual artist because I do a lot of oil paintings. I think about uh, working on sculptures and installations even when I'm at work. I think there is always a constant drive to produce art whenever I can while pursuing different career paths. Okay, let's talk about uh, the art part uh, later. So how is your day-to-day -day at Nuvu right now? So Nuvu is a special place in Cambridge where uh, middle and high school students get to uh, learn about hands-on prototyping and problem solving through an architectural studio model. So my day-to-day -day usually looks like um, this, where I walk into school and there are a lot of laser-cut 3D printed gadgets um, around the classroom. There are students deeply invested in problem solving, creating different tools and objects that can create very interesting dialogues. It's very different from a conventional school setting where there's a lecture given by the teacher and the students are sitting in rows of tables. And there's a lot of collaboration between other teachers who are there. Uh, and we program a lot of interesting curriculums together. We have a lot of guests from all around Cambridge, Boston, greater Boston area who come and speak with the students. So it's, it's, uh, there's a great variety of things that happen from day to day. It's never the same day. So what are you taking personally from it? Personally, I've been searching for ways to combine my arts background, my uh, things I learned from the design discipline, and combining those things together to a more, uh, and putting it into a uh, productive use. And I think, uh, moving closer to the education sector has helped me achieve that by sharing what I've learned in the classroom setting, especially with the younger age group that I got the opportunity to work with. Uh, Nuvu, the school that G is talking about, is a school that we also mentioned in a previous podcast uh, with Nathan Mellenbrink. So how does uh, be, not being an architect have changed your experience throughout the GSD and Nuvu? Yeah, it always puts me in um, observation mode. So I get to 
be an artist, come into an environment that is a little bit different from the discipline I'm used to. And I take away a lot of tools and the different pedagogy that is used in architectural context and apply that to my own creative ideology processes. And I think I'm constantly trying to push myself out of my comfort zone, which um, has led me to different trajectories, different fields, and yeah. What would you say are the main differences between uh, your work at the software company and, and the one that you're doing now at Nuvu? I think I'm definitely working with two very drastically different um, student bodies. And I don't know if I could call physicians as students, but what they're doing is they're building um, a platform that's going to help with recertification, skills assessment, and this is an age group that's a lot older than I am. And now at Nuvu, I'm working with students who are between the ages of 14 to 17, which is a very different experience. And there is a there is more level of inquiry and optimism with the younger students, I think. How do you think the model of Nuvu can uh, help uh, the students that are taking these classes compared to people who go to regular high school? I think about this a lot when I'm there. How would my school experience have been different had I had an outlet like Nuvu? Um, and I think what it provides is a very creative environment where students don't have to feel they have to excel in one particular subject area, but they can combine all these different um, interdisciplinary concepts and bring them into one space where they can actually have impact on contemporary issues. In the process of working in a creative studio environment, you find out a lot about yourself and, and what you're good at. So that's the best thing I think you can get out of an environment like that. And are there any projects that you recall now that have surprised you of student projects or things that you've done? Yeah, I think the most memorable, and I've only you know, worked here for a short uh, span of time now, but the most memorable project, I think, is one that came out of the gun violence, the gun shootings, um, and students have proposed this idea of creating a memorial. They were looking at a lot of installation artists who have worked on World War II memorials, like Christian Boltanski, And they ended up with a very large scale um, installation for the victims of gun violence that is a memorial and it's called Lockers. You mentioned before to me that uh, the students were thinking of doing a podcast. Uh, how, what, what's that project about? This was a very informal conversation I had with some other uh, teacher who was visiting Cambridge who had mentioned his interest in curating a classroom environment so that students can come up with nonlinear narratives and prose and other experiment with other forms of writing through podcasts and how that can become an archival tool on its own. What was the focus of uh, the work you did at the GSD, at the Graduate School of Design? So at the GSD, I was in a program that was focusing on public art and dealing with the audience within the public domain. And what was interesting about that program was it got me revisiting some of the previous projects I had worked on at art school. And one of those projects was a, a hydroponic tree installation that dealt with the idea of uh, two very dissonant temperaments coming together in this artificial uh, watering system that also resembled a segmented tree. And I wanted to bring that project back into a more design context where maybe this time it has an application for something. And that got me thinking a lot about uh, soilless farming, farming, artificial farming system, gardening systems, and the stewardship behind, um, behind these projects. Can you tell the audience what hydroponic means? Yeah, hydroponic means that you're using a uh, watering system to grow your plants. So it might be um, an automated drip system. It could be a bunch of PVC pipes running, carrying water and nutrient down a root tank. It takes a variety of forms. And I think what's interesting about what's happening now is that people are experimenting with this on a lot of different scales, whether that's just a desktop setup or a community build or something industrial where you're renovating warehouses into 
a completely green verdant garden sphere. <laughs> what is some other work that you did at Carnegie Mellon University? Yeah, so that my time at Carnegie Mellon School of Art was a very interesting time for exploring all the different um, mediums that they were trying to introduce to the students. But being a very uh, conceptual art school, there were a lot of um, performance-related works. There's a lot of site-specific work that students get to work in. And I was very interested in working with sculpture, but also introducing different types of mediums. So the project I worked on for my final project was a maple tree, and that was where I started. And then I introduced some more artificial components like a dripping system that was integrated into the form of the tree. Um, yeah. Well, I would like to also know a bit more about what you mentioned before. You're a visual artist and you have been involved in art projects and looking at uh, different mediums. Uh, what role does this play right now in your life and how do you deal with like having uh, some time for art or like pursuing your own projects there and also having a full-time job at Nubu? Yeah, so I think it took me a long time to realize that being a full-time artist takes a lot of, you know, strenuous effort. It takes uh, a lot of time and energy. So I've configured <laughs> a way to devote some part of my time into just pure art making. And then the rest is kind of, you know, dedicating my time to uh, my career, which is more geared towards education. Um, and I think that turned out to be a really great compromise because being a painter or a sculptor or an artist leaves you to a lot of time on your own where you get bogged down by a lot of sub subjective opinions and you are creating this high concept piece that can separate you from the public, from everyone else. And I think having a, a different outlet where you're forced to immerse yourself in a different context where you're not making something for yourself or where you're not just doing something for the sake of art, but trying to gear that creativity into a very specific application or a goal. It really has helped in centering me in my position as a creative professional. What are some of the main struggles that you can think of that you have uh, to pursue art? I think there is a part of being an artist that is always, at least in my experience, uh, you're constantly seeking some sort of nurturing environment for you to pursue your art. And that could be an expensive task. It could also be a very time-consuming effort. And if you don't have a good foundation to build this on top of, it could really distract you from going after what you really want, which is to just create art. How do you choose what projects to focus on? I think whatever is most urgent or immediate in that current time frame is always a good starting point when you're thinking about creating a project. One of my professors have once to has once told me that the best kind of art is are the ones that can reflect the voice of that particular time. And I try to embody that as much as I can when I get to work. What are some current projects that you are working on at the moment? I have a series of large-scale oil paintings I've been working on in the past year, temporarily calling it Morphology Series. It's The style is very abstract. It's very grotesque at times. I'm trying to incorporate uh, very strong, uh, bold colors. But the main idea behind it is that it's visualizing a constant flow or movement of uh, formation. So there is something about the painting that's constantly trying to move into a fixed position without actually being in a complete composition. What other um, activities or hobbies do you do apart from art? I try to pick up on instruments I have given up in the past, <laughs> whether that be flute, piano, classical guitar. I have not mastered one yet, um, but I think it's always something nice to come back to because every time I do revisit them, I realize how much of me still enjoys playing an instrument just for yeah, what it does for you. Would you consider your life simple? 
I don't think so. <laughs> but it is something I aspire to at all times. Yeah, because in the end, life is simple and sublime. <laughs> What are the trade offs that you've identified from having a full time job and also trying to pursue art? It's actually been a fine balance, but if there's anything, it's always time because it does take a long time to create a painting. It does take a lot of time to、um, think about what it is that you want to paint. So you have less of that reflective time period where you're left to your own device to just pour out some paint onto a blank canvas. <laughs> and that gets harder and harder to do as your life becomes more and more involved in something that's very goal oriented and very directly driven. Is there any contribution that you have in mind that you would like to do with your art or with other design work? And do you have a strategy to? Account with like feedback or how you me- how do you measure progress? So right after I got out of my undergrad program,、um, I did devote about a year trying to have a studio environment for myself, where I was working on paintings full time. And what was nice about that time was because I'm immersed in this artist community, I have. A lot of people who I can exhibit with. Who there are a lot of venues that are venues and goals that are attainable. But what's been a little bit difficult is that this is a very、uh, tech focused town, <laughs> being you know in the center of institutions like MIT, and so I think I've been brainstorming a lot about the best ways to share the work that you create, and it is. Something I would like to get better at, but another thing I've realized in the past year is that there could be better ways of exhibition that goes beyond the gallery space, that goes beyond museums. You know, local gallery crawls. It could take shape in many ways. But having worked in curatorial settings, I am more drawn to the idea of kind of programming how this might. Look more than figuring out how I would exhibit or share my personal work, because I think there is something really impactful with a whole、um, spectrum of art being shared than just a very singular、uh, exhibit. What role do you think、uh, the engagement of other people plays in your work? In many fields and professions, I think it's always important to consider the feedback of others,、um, just because it could only add, you know, more perspectives, more layers to whatever it is that you're bringing in. So I do take as much of that in as I can.、Um, and there's also something special about just having something for yourself. Actually, with The most recent series of paintings I've been working on—it's more of a cathartic experience. It's、uh, more therapeutic than anything else, and that's really where I leave it for now. And maybe there is, there will come a time when this seems relevant to share, and I might be surprised to find a lot of people find it relatable. So it's really up to the time and the context, I think. How would you define art? It's a very hard question.、Um, I know. <laughs> I think art can be described as a vessel for carrying a very personal yet universal message or theme. Everyone has so many different ways of expressing their interpretations of the world that they live in, and if they're able to bring that out through a particular medium by channeling that. Whether that's through poetry, whether that's through photography or painting, architecture,、um, yeah. Can you think of anything that you've realized on the last years doing art that other young artists can take advantage of, or maybe a way of looking at things that you didn't have before? Yeah, I think there are definitely so many more tools that can be utilized. A lot of the younger generation. Or a lot of the younger students that I'm now working with are much more accustomed to digital fabrication techniques. They are learning how to code and express creativity through that. So I would say just you utilize what's available for you in your time and try to expand your tool or color palette as much as you can. 
Well, that's a great recommendation. <laughs> I yeah, I think anyone who can expand their uh, tool set with things that are new are going to find uh, a lot of opportunities, right? Yeah. I'm also interested on who were people that pushed you to continue and supported you? A lot of my friends ha are practicing artists, writers, um, and they're always, you know, we have, we share similar problems. We have uh, similar ideas and hopes and dreams. <laughs> um, and they've always reminded me of conversations we've had together about art. Um, and just looking back, it may sound like we were over romanticizing about what, how much art can impact or change the world. But um, having that reminder, no matter how naive that may sound at certain points is always a good thing. I think the person though, who has really motivated me to grow and really push myself out of that comfort zone would be my mom, who is the most harshest critic I've yet encountered. So <laughs> despite what people say about, you know, architecture school critiques being harsh. I have never yet met a more critical person than my mother who knows me more than anyone. Well, thank you for sharing that. I also would love to know a bit more about um, how do you deal with uh, changing uh, art mediums? So what are your tools? Yeah, um, and this is the most frustrating yet invigorating part about how I've been changing my approach to art making recently. I was originally trained to use a lot of the traditional mediums like uh, oil paint on canvas, um, watercolors, uh, silkscreen printing, darkroom processing, and I still do love all of that um, physical and tactile component of craft and technique that's involved in fine arts. But what I've gained a lot of insight into through my uh, interaction with a lot of people here in Cambridge was the opportunity to expand my tool set beyond those traditional mediums. And that may involve me, you know, trying to grapple with all these new softwares that can introduce me to um, ways uh, of translating my paintings into a virtual landscape even, um, or make 2D art into something interactive. So right now, being a coach at Nuvu has pushed me to take on a lot of these new digital mediums uh, so that I could at least introduce them to the students who want to look into different ways of making. Um, and that might involve like Arduino, that may involve learning new game engines, um, or new rendering tools, understanding ways to do uh, VR, AR in the classroom environment and how to best teach that. So I'm getting my hands dirty in all of these um, different types of tools. Do you try to stick with one medium when you're doing art? I have been criticized for being too much of a generalist and I can agree with that. <laughs> um, there has been a lot of pivoting of tools and styles that have drastically changed the way I produce things in my past, but I am comfortable being more of a generalist than an expert because it's so easy to go down a tunnel once you're fixated on one thing. So I actually prefer to get a taste of everything that there is and then hone in on something when I have the impulsive uh, motivation to dive in fully. Well, I think every time that you get uh, focused on one topic, even if you get really fixated into one technique or something, you're going to find that there are divergent paths that you can take. So I think, I mean, the more you obsess with the topic, the more different options you're going to feel that you have in that um, context. So maybe you're not such a generalist that much. <laughs> I just say like, even if you stick to one type of paint or a one medium, there's going to be like tons of different techniques that you can still apply. Yeah, and that's definitely true. In regards to the kind of overall themes that I've worked on throughout the years, it's been pretty consistent 
it's more about consolidating the overwhelming amount of tools and access there is to all of these things that you could at any point decide to, yeah, indulge in. <laughs> so what would be the ideal work or like art session that you would have? How would you start doing it or how, what things would you use and how long would you spend doing it? If we were to kind of reinterpret like an art studio, I think it would be very interesting to actually have someone there who doesn't come from an arts background um, facilitating this classroom with you and try to come up with ways in which non-experts or people who don't come from the same discipline work together collaboratively to redefine what a new contemporary art piece may look like. So let's leave art design and education aside for a bit and talk a bit about you. Okay. So I would like to know, so how does one day in the life of G look like? Uh, so I like to start my day early. I wake up, um, grab a cup of coffee. And if I have time, if it is a day I woke up early enough, I try to do some yoga where I could do some breathing exercises. And this is something new I've been trying lately, and it has really improved the start of my day. And then I, you know, jump right into work, and each day I try to make something different from the previous, uh, whether that's a new approach to the way I work or whether that's a change in my schedule. And that's how I, yeah, try to come up with different ways for me to in stay engaged in my day to day. How does your commute look like? My daily commute is down Mass Ave in Central Square in Cambridge, where there's a, an abundance of diversity. And that's a really great reminder of the places that I want to uh, work and live in, where I'm always exposed to different types of people, different demographic. Um, yeah. Do you have any daily habits or intentions to implement daily habits in your life might be morning or bedtime rituals or something i try to exercise as much as i can but something that has been a fun experiment is doing headstands <laughs> because they don't uh take up too much of your time but you see you feel a lot of great results from doing perfecting a headstand and i'm not saying i have perfected it but it's something I've been working towards perfecting. <laughs> uh, it's, it's moving very slowly, but <laughs> there's something nice about trying to have complete control of the way you um, carry your body. Are there any specific values that you would say your life is determined by? Um, there are lots of values I live by, and I think one of the biggest that I try to abide to is living with compassion, because I tend to get, you know, um, absorbed in my, in my own world and get caught up in tunnel vision. So whenever I do feel unhappy or And when I find myself in a depressive state, I remind myself of everything that exists around me and kind of try to come out of myself. Um, and the best thing to uh, remember during those times is to recognize that there are other people who may need your compassion more than you might need for yourself. No, that's a great thing. I... I can relate to that a lot and I would love to know so in what have you identified any patterns and when you think that state of mind happens to you and and what things or what activities you try to do to get out of it I think the most dangerous thing is when you find yourself in a position where you no longer feel uh active or engaged in your surrounding uh environment and that could be kind of a self-driven isolation Or it could be you being too caught up in your own emotions. Um, so when, and I do find myself in those times a lot, actually, especially during the winter months here <laughs> in Boston. But the best ways I've tried to come out of that is to actually, uh, 
read and watch the news <laughs> and just getting a, a bigger context for the times that the time that I'm existing in. And that usually does the trick of waking me up and getting me out of the out of my house and figuring out ways to bring that activism spirit <laughs> out onto the yeah out into the environment so whatever it is that I might try to do so if you ever get bored how do you face boredom I am very bad at dealing with boredom it is one of my biggest enemies but thankfully I have really great friends around me <laughs> who I can contact during these desperate times of need of companionship and laughter um, and I think boredom mainly comes from the fact that um, you are probably spending too much time in your own head and so in those times I always try to spark up a new conversation with someone but if none of those options are available I would probably just start watercoloring or drawing um, I read Nat Geo or a nice work of poetry <laughs> and just, yeah, spend my time that way too. What if you get bored when you're doing something else? So you're engaging in some activity, maybe work or art already, and then you get bored. Is that different or how do you approach that? There are definitely times when you get bored working on a project for a long duration of time and the process just gets very monotonous. Um, and when I'm faced with those moments, I usually just halt everything that I'm doing um, and take a complete break from it if I am given that opportunity to. Um, because I think once you step back and um, have some time to detach yourself from that project or that environment, you'll realize um, that you appreciate it a lot more than you thought previously. When do your best ideas come up? I think best ideas come up when I am staring up into the night sky. <laughs> And that may sound very um, corny, but it's actually very true for me because all those moments where I was stargazing, I remember very vividly. And I think there's something about... Um, looking up to the sky and seeing the expansiveness and the glimmer of hope and stars shining above you. <laughs> you get very inspired by the silence of, uh, of the night sky. And it's almost like staring into a blank, blank canvas and you just see little uh, glimmers of light that you can connect together. So I guess in many ways, the constellations are a good source of inspiration. What is your relationship with uh, social media? Aside from the very selective uh, 60 or something friends I have on Instagram, I have no other outlets for social media. And this is somewhat voluntary. I have thought a lot about the role of social media, or at least the role of social media that would play into my life. And I have decided that I don't necessarily feel the need for it because if it is about staying connected to those around me and being able to keep in touch, I think there are more intimate ways that can be done. And rather than have a thousand friends, I would just like to have five best friends. <laughs> um, yeah, but I also realized there are other outlets um, that there are great advantages to having social media platforms, especially if you're trying to incorporate it into your work, into your um, business. So yeah, my, my opinions on it might change, but for now I have not had, I have not found a need for it. What are potential uses that you think you might give it in the future? If at any point I get uh, more confident and better at, about sharing my artwork, I might use that as a way to keep my patrons or my collaborators um, up to date with what I'm what I've been making. One topic that I always talk about is disconnection because I think disconnection and focus are really tied together mm -hmm. because they they're both trying to run away from distractions and I think that the way you described your use of social media you probably have a really easy time disconnecting. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
So, so that concept of disconnection is interesting to me because um, once you disconnect, I think you start realizing what you're longing for. And many times when you when you're constantly holding on to something, when you're constantly connected, you don't realize what it is that you're craving or desiring. And I think it's only in these moments of this complete disconnect where you start to realize how much you long for something. And that hunger and that appetite usually is a big driving factor for getting me started on a new project or a new venture. Um, yeah. So, and you don't have many social media accounts. So you don't share that much online, but what are things that you would consume from the internet? I consume a lot of people's opinions, actually. I love hearing all the voices of the internet. <laughs> I think that's the broadest spectrum of uh, varying opinions that I'm going to receive. And in what format or what mediums do you consume those? Let's say podcasts, magazines, newspaper. I prefer to hear a lot of podcasts. Um, I think there's um, an enduring quality to this auditory platform where you're just listening in on people talking and conversing. So I do listen to a lot of podcasts and public radio stations whenever I can. What do you think a um, healthy relationship with technology can look like? I think just as long as you know what you're using it for, <laughs> you probably have a healthy relationship with it. I've noticed a lot of people who, you know, use technology as a crutch or out of daily uh, habit. I think the trick is to not become addicted or too attached to it where it becomes more of a prosthetic than a tool. And in what things do you believe technology can help us having uh, more joyful lives? I think technology uh, provides us with the opportunity to simulate a lot of experiences um, without having the risk of um, it being reality. What could you think could be the role of technology in design and art? I think technology will constantly make new tools available for us that reduces time, that reduces repetitiveness. And the remaining contribution we can have as designers and creators would be kind of curating these different array of tools and making sure that there is a novel application behind whatever it is that we're using these tools with. Okay, now I'm going to leave the topic of technology a bit aside and I'm going to ask you a few short questions to learn a bit more about yourself. Okay. So these questions are going to be pretty disconnected between okay. each other. That's fine. So do you have any book recommendations for the listeners? The most recent book uh, that I reread is actually by Susan Sontag. Uh, it's called Regarding the suffering regarding the pain of others and it's a great book i would recommend to anyone interested in how uh, we as humans metabolize uh, graphic content and visuals whether that may be photography from war, war zones or yeah anything horrific that we see on the news from day to day if i ask you for a successful person who's the first person who comes to mind a successful person um hmm I guess at least when I narrow it down to successful artists, contemporary artists, I would say um, Marlene Dumas, <laughs> who is a female artist I aspire to. What is your take on clothing? Uh, I think it's a very fun and creative outlet for self-expression. Um, I know that I spend a lot of time <laughs> dwelling in this. There's also... Yeah, it's it's just a fun aspect of life. <laughs> Is there any purchase of $100 or less that you've done on the last month that has had a positive impact in your life? Yes, and it's funny that you ask this question because it was only very recently when I purchased three new watercolor brushes. And previous to this, I had just used um, just standard paintbrushes and I've always had 
um, a small tad bit of discontent with <laughs> the way they absorbed the paint. <laughs> but the most recent purchase spree was on three new watercolor paintbrushes made out of uh, pony hair. <laughs> and it was a very worthy purchase. It definitely makes the process of watercoloring much more enjoyable. It seems to absorb the paint much quicker and it just has better effects. And it's something I've actually not thought about that much previous to this great new experience. Is there anything particular about how you distribute your money? So I didn't really notice this about myself until someone <laughs> mentioned this to me, but I think I have a habit of squirreling away money. <laughs> and what that means is I kind of treat them like chestnuts um, and then just distribute them throughout my tree trunk in different places. So I might forget that I have a chestnut in this drawer and then find it and then treat myself when I find it. I might have a designated spot where I have, um, you know, three chestnuts. And this is not to say I have a lot of chestnuts, but I like to distribute them for surprise effect and for just saving so I don't use it. <laughs> What's your favorite um, phone application or online service? Mm, I like Spotify. I think it's kind of neat to have almost um, a companion who can curate your playlist for you. And I think we take this for granted, but whenever it plays or recommends a song that I have forgotten for a long time, I am very surprised by the amount of joy that it brings <laughs> from such a simple yeah, app or service. Is there anything that you've taken away from your involvement in sustainability? Yes, so I am still and always will be invested in this green movement <laughs> just because I love being an earthling. I love earth. I think it's beautiful. And when we distill everything down to, you know, uh, the, talking about the environment, I think it obliterates a lot of the unnecessary conflicts that we discuss nowadays. I mean, I can't think of anything that's more urgent and more necessary to be discussed than keeping this earth healthy and alive for us to inhabit. Um, and I think there isn't as much of an emphasis than I would like. And it's something I will always come back to, this whole topic of nature and the, the environment the organic versus artificial. If you could send one sentence to the world, uh, what would it say? Well, it wouldn't be directly from me. I would be quoting uh, Anthony Burgess, the author of Clockwork Orange. Um, and he says in his intro to that book, uh, eat this Swedish segment or spit it out. And I always really... that resonated with me because he has such a great attitude for people trying to censor his work and um, trying to push away from like his raw honesty. And all that this says is that you have, you know, a, a sweet segment to offer to the world. And if you want a taste of it, go ahead. If you don't, then don't. Um, and that's the kind of approach I would like to have with, yeah, the world. <laughs> We either get along or we don't. <laughs> Can you think of unnecessary things that make your day more complex? If I was less self-critical, I think my life would be a lot simpler. And a lot of that has to do with me constantly trying to evolve into, you know, a better version of the self that I was yesterday and the day before. Um, but sometimes you just need to give yourself a break and pat yourself on the back. <laughs> How do you deal with uh, both digital and physical clutter? If you were to come over to my house, it would look pretty clean <laughs> and spotless. But the minute you open one of the drawers, everything might collapse on you. And that's kind of, it works the same way on my desktop. Um, <laughs> and I've attempted to reorganize and, you know, distribute things in a very uh, harmonious order where I would be able to find something from before more easily. But I think it's just my personality 
and I can't be as OCD as I would like to be. <laughs> and there's something about clutter and chaos that I embrace and try to cultivate on a small scale. <laughs> Um, just for spontaneity, just so that there's always an element of surprise when I find something buried underneath my pile of clutter or yeah, chaos. <laughs> Do you have any cleaning rituals? If I wake up on a Sunday morning and the sun is shining and the weather is great, I air out the house and um, I just target one specific area I want to clean impeccably <laughs> and that could be like one drawer in the kitchen or one bookshelf that I'm going to reorganize by author and year <laughs> so yeah that's my approach I think cleaning should be a fun enjoyable experience what is your spirit animal uh, my spirit animal would be um, anything aquatic with a bunch of tentacles so I usually just say I'm a jellyfish and I think it's because I feel like I have a lot of different um, strings that project outwards and extends, and each of those ends try to connect to different different parts of my environment and yeah, multi sensory experience. What role does nature play in your life? Nature encompasses everything in my life. I feel very connected to nature. I feel most like myself when I see myself reflected in nature and always being in an urban environment, I make it an objective to get out. So before we move on, um, where can people find you online or your work? Um, they can visit my website. It's just www.swedishsegment.com. And before we start wrapping up, I would like to know what role does simple living and slow living have in your life? Simple living helps me prioritize what matters the most in my life, just keeping my priorities simple and straight. Slow living <laughs> uh, allows me to meditate on the importance of whatever it is I'm doing or investing time into in my life. Um, so yeah, I am very, I'm all about the slow and steady club. Have you read any books related to this? Um, I think it's, it, it may not be directly related, but The Poetics of Space just talks about moments when you reflect to the crevices and corners of your house. And it's supposed to bring up all these other internal questions about where you are in terms of space and time. So I think that would be a good book to reflect on that. Before we wrap up, is there anything that you would like to ask me? Yeah, I wonder if this strength, uh, if interviewing people uh, for your podcast and having them discuss these topics about their work in great detail with you has improved or strengthened the friendship you have with these people? Well, it's surprising how much you can get to know someone in like one hour, uh, even though you're with them every single day. Yeah. But there are aspects of everyone's life that are not openly shared every day or that are given for granted or that uh, even the the person doesn't give it uh, enough importance for other people to actually get to know it. And of course, we can Google each other and we can <laughs> read about uh, what others have been doing online. But I think these conversations are so much more personal and also at the same time, super public, mm -hmm. which is great for uh, me to unveil or discover uh, the great work or like how other people live their lives. And another thing I have noticed is that I... I'm getting a lot of different perspectives and points of view about uh, the topics that I like to reflect about. So it's really good to see how other people, not only how other people think about certain topics, but also about the nuances of to what they pay attention to. The exact question to eight different people is completely interpreted in a different way. Mm -hmm. And every person takes it to their personal life 
And I think that's great because even topics like boredom and disconnection, uh, we might assume that everyone understands they are the same, but for each person is a completely different story. So that's what I love about being able to ask a series of similar questions and getting completely different answers. Yeah. Well, so this was the Getting Simple podcast uh, with G. As she said, you can find her work at uh, SwedishSegment.com. I will post a detailed list of episode notes and links uh, on the website. You can find the notes for this episode on GettingSimple.com forward slash podcast. Before you go, I'd like to remind you that you can join the Getting Simple mailing list at GettingSimple.com forward slash follow. And it would be also great if you consider rating our podcast on Apple Podcasts, as this is the best way for other people to find about it. And you can also support uh, this project financially on our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash getting simple. I really hope uh, you enjoyed this conversation and I'll see you on the next episode. Thank you, Nana. And really like big thanks uh, to G. I think our conversation has been great. Thank you. Anything else you want to say? Yeah, I mean, it's not often you get to have these conversations with your friends. Um, and this has been a very uh, interesting and invigorating hour. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yay. Thank you.